I find it alarming the way you, the way a consensus is formed about what's right and what's wrong, about who stars are, who great people are, who the goodies are, who the baddies are, <clears throat> in the uh, in music industry or in politics or anything else. And uh, it seems so easy to do, just to sort of persuade a million people that X is terribly important, or Y is the most important person in the world, or Z is the mm -hmm. worst person in the world. It seems so easy to do that. I can only conclude people want to believe something altogether in a bunch, just almost for the sake of it. They get some sort of comfort out of it, which is... Uh, we, it sounds quite obvious, but it is interesting, because... Uh, if you talk to most people, you say, no, I, I'm interested in the truth, I'm interested in how it really is. But I'm not sure that that is what people are mostly interested in. I think what people are mostly interested in is getting a warm, cosy feeling about, about agreeing with everyone else and that, that proving that they're right. Well, I mean, Ireland's a good example. I mean, what we call news in England is, generally speaking, army propaganda. Uh, I mean, I'd take it that it's like that, that all states operate like that, that, that uh, powerful groups basically... Not, they do control the media to, to, to serve their own self-image, the state does. And uh, I take that for granted. Most of the things that people say about how awful it is in Eastern Bloc countries, for example, Warsaw Pet countries, I think are true about us here. I think, in fact, if there's something more sinister here, it's the fact that we're much better at it. <laughs> mm. That um, we that our media can create heroes, tell you who to love, and I'm not saying that, that they're wrong or right about these particular people, but just look at the heroes and the villains. It's like some sort of it's really an extension of we're all children. It's like an extension of Father Christmas versus Guy Fawkes or something like that. It goes on you know, who's Father Christmas this week? The Pope. Who's next week? Prince Charles. Who's Guy Fawkes? Tony Benn. Or, you know, and it goes, it's just sort of good. And we, you know, it's just like children, as I say. Mm. It's in a school pantomime. And um, the decisions are made, you know. And we must make a point about this man represents evil, this man represents good. And how, they, how these people are chosen and how they're promoted um, isn't really questioned because... Everybody says, oh, I know we've got a free press. And you say, how do you know? Well, I read it in the papers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, at least in those other countries, they know, you know, what propaganda is. They know where it's coming from. In a way, they're mentally freer. Like American war isn't basically, they'll never declare the Third World War. They've been fighting it since Hiroshima, but they'll never declare it. So mm. people are going around saying, oh, when's this terrible Third World War going to start? What do they think Hiroshima was? What do they think Nagasaki was? What do they think Vietnam was? What do they think Angola is now? What do they think El Salvador is now? Mm. It's the Third World War. But uh, it's all covert. It's all done by not declaring a war. It's all done It's all done by camouflage and not mm. declaring yourself. And uh, When the Russians are really done, when they want to send Russian troops in somewhere, when the Americans haven't done anything so daft for ages, I mean, at your most cynical, you can look at it as... Uh, uh, the, the white man doing isometrics or whatever it is. When what's that thing you do to toughen, toughen up your muscles? When you put yeah, your, your yeah, right hand against your left yeah. hand, push and pull. And uh, the, although this is sort of we're presented with this great ideological war which is going on, it's actually Western Europeans and their descendants in other parts of the world consolidating their grip by having this apparent war which never actually quite involved fighting each other but seems to involve killing an awful lot of other people <laughs> who have nothing to do with it. In hundreds of years to come, struggle between East and West may be seen as about as, as serious a struggle as between the white rose and the red rose, you know, the, 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 uh, mm. the, the Lancastrians and the Watsits or the other struggles between Catholics and Protestants or this sort of not a struggle that ever gets won, but just becomes sort of archaic and replaced by some other struggle. Yeah, not the kind of clan thing in Scotland that's yeah. just completely... Yeah, it just becomes a sort of uh, ritualised... Uh, football match. Yeah, football match. <laughs> there we have it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. There's no doubt that the specific 
preoccupations of of where we get selected become very important and do influence what happens. But uh, how they get the gig in the first place and who really decides, I think we should have uh, someone, uh, Regan this year, or I think we should have Carter this year, or I think we should have Margaret Thatcher. The people who actually decide <coughs> who these people are going to be are not you and me. And then these things are decided in private, as I say, by powerful people presenting, like, like now, the, the rich and powerful in England are deciding, well, we don't seem to have, uh, seem to have overdone it a bit on this, uh, uh, seem to have got ho hoist on this monetarist peg. How are we going to keep power? I know we'll invent this new political party. Well, we'll call it a new one. Actually, we'll just drag out some of the geezers who've been running the country for the last 20 years. We'll call it a new political party. And name it after one of those rich German ones, like a social democrat or something like that. You know, one of those sort of meaningless double barrel sort of names that everyone feels don't quite know what it means. But these decisions aren't being made, they're not being made democratic either. They're made, but made by people who have power uh, in order to keep it. And who these leaders are is decided largely in private. When you get a ballot form, you say you can vote for whom you like. You don't vote for who you like, you vote for one of the names on that ballot form. You're free to vote for one of the people we let you vote for. That's right. You're free to vote for one of these two or three people. And if you don't vote, which a lot of people don't, they then say, well, there you are. That's the apathetic public. It shows that they don't mind the way things are. Mm. It doesn't show anything of the sort. It just shows that there isn't anyone on that particular <laughs> list that they want to vote and for. And then the fanatic goes and votes for... Well, uh, Warren Beatty said, anyway, American elections, particularly the history of American elections, is that the secret of um, Republican power is simply is not to get an overwhelming number of votes, it's to demoralise the potential Democrat vote to a point where it doesn't bother to go out and vote. And that's what happened at the last election. Mm. Black Americans didn't bother to vote at the last one. They tried. They tried with Carter. They even got their token black out there in the United Nations. But he was due for the chop and he got it. And uh, Andrew Young. And uh, they knew that they were only going to get token representation whether it's Democrat or Republican. So uh, they didn't vote next time. That's, that's how I read it. Uh, which makes it very easy for all the people who do vote. They don't have to be even that many of them, comparatively. The media literally create news because uh, you get the feeling that you knew the riots were going to end about the time another riot would stop selling a newspaper as a novel event. Yeah. And that, that was the lifespan of riots, just the way uh, the lifespan of the hunger strikers is going to be as a political issue, is going to be their reportable novelty. Mm. You know, so we just had the ninth, or was it the tenth? Nobody knows his name, everyone knows Bobby Sands, name. Right? Although, there again, there are things that are divided into things which are constantly, you come back to, and other things which you only mention occasionally, which is another very subtle way that a consensus opinion is formed. So that, for example, where we'll have a a sustained return to uh, the union movement's negotiations in Poland, you might, I shouldn't think one in a thousand people know about <coughs> uh, the problems the union movement's having in Turkey, for example, mm. where all the trade unionists are being uh, imprisoned, tortured, etc. And the reason we're not hearing about the Turkish trade union troubles, which are far, far worse than anything's happening in Poland, is because the government is American-backed, is England-backed, and we want to keep those fucking workers quiet there. So it, it's not that we're censored. It's not that we're not told about Turkey. You can find out about Turkey. I know about Turkey. I'll root it out. But it's not going to be circulated into the general consciousness. Mm. While there's been this sort of apparent democratic struggle at the top of the political parties and uh, among, you know, amongst the unions and amongst nations and so on, there's been... A fantastic establishment, quite quietly, of a particular power block at the moment, which is that Rhys Mogg, he's the editor of the Times, right, he's now controller of the BBC, and his second in command is also an ex-Conservative uh, candidate. Now, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? And when did we last have an election form around here asking uh, who was going to be in charge of our major public radio mm -hmm. network? Never. I mean, who on earth decided? You wouldn't know the names of one of them. And, and, uh, and this is a major blow in control of the most powerful proper propaganda organisation in the world. And he's just shifted into power there. He's sitting there. Mm. How, I, how I would have done the rights if I'd have got in a week before. 
Who's heard of, you know, nobody's even talking about this geezer. Immensely powerful. You know, he's got as much power as Reagan, I would say. And also, you, you can see Thatcher in that way, you know, mm. and, and people sort of slagging Thatcher off. But, you know, behind it are these sort of people that... They're missing the point. I mean, it, I, I get the Morning Star and they sort of, they seem to be falling the same trap like, as inverting Tory propaganda. You know, they go down with Thatcher, get rid of Thatcher. Just, that is just a, a tool of all this. I mean, yeah. what are you going to do about the way bankers take out all their money from a country that they call theirs, that's actually been earned by people mining and growing food and so on, but they call it theirs, and invest in another country where, the, where there's still sort of slave wages because they can get more investment from it, and just sort of go on an investment strike, any country where the workers get any strength, you know. Now, mm. Those people, we don't know their names, you know, who are they? Uh, you know, I might not have the right solutions, but it's not even being discussed as the issue. Well, it's like, they use the word intelligence in that way. You could use it, I mean, like with dogs, they call a good dog a dog that does what it's told. Yeah. <laughs> but a good policeman and a good soldier, policeman and soldiers will do what they're told. Mm. Back to all music, do you sort of see what you do as... Um, if it's the right word, subversive or rebellious or anything like this. I think subversive is too negative a word, really. Uh, I don't just want to upset apple carts. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, I do don't want to upset people because, I, as far as I can see, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd rather reassure people that the people they're frightened of uh, and they're calling baddies uh, aren't baddies. Uh, you know, the people they're calling goodies they should be mistrustful of. Just trying to juggle around with the imagery that people are given about who's goodies and who's baddies. Mm. Uh, but um, I don't see myself as a musical terrorist, if you like. I would, I would say I was more in the reassuring business. In other words, I did Guantanamera because I like the Cubans. And I think it's a real shame that these great big countries like America are frightened of a tiny little country <laughs> like Cuba. And I just think it's pathetic and daft and uh, insulting and cowardly. So that to show the human face of, of uh, people that we're meant to be alienated from, to make our system run sort of more smoothly and to get rid of our guilt complexes about what we do to people. 